three women dead and a 15-year-old girl critically injured. <laughs> Among the fallen was a mother and daughter pair that was stabbed a total of 98 times. <laughs> If you ask anyone in Singapore whether or not they've heard about the Yishun triple murder case, chances are they have. In fact, it could possibly be one of the most sensationalized criminal phenomena in Singapore's history. It happened in 2008, and by the time this episode airs, that's 14 years ago. But even till today, the horrific nature of the crime still echoes throughout people's memories. Perhaps the most iconic memory would be a photo of the 42-year-old killer named Wang Zhijian. The haunting image of Wang shows him smiling as he was shackled and taken back to his apartment in Yishun to reenact his crime. Revived from the archives of Singapore's darkest moments in history, the case unveils the fatal aftermath of a failed relationship, one that's built on lies and deceit. You're listening to Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast brought to you by Mediacorp and produced by 1UP Media. This episode might contain scenes of violence and criminal activity. Listener discretion is advised. Born in 1966, Wang Zhijian spent his childhood years in Tianjin, a major port city in northeastern China. He grew up with his only brother named Wang Zhijie, and by 1996, 30 year old Wang Zhijian was now working as a day trader at a brokerage firm in China. Wang was also a married man and fathered a son of his own. After some time, Wang left the firm and started a new career at the port of Tianjin. It's the largest port in northern China and also the main maritime gateway to China's capital city of Beijing. This was also where Wang would meet a familiar face. One day at work, Wang ran into a woman named Zhang Meng. She was also a native of Tianjin and was the same age. Wang knew that he had seen her before. He just couldn't recall where. He walked toward her and said, Hey, have we met before? You look familiar. Wang Zhijian, is that you? Wang smiled, almost relieved that she remembered. I think we've met before at the brokerage firm. I recall you being introduced to me by one of my previous co-workers. I'm glad to see you. What are you doing here? Zhang Meng said. It was a brief but warm conversation. At the time, Zhang Meng was working for a shipping company that frequently used the port. Through this encounter, they found out that they lived relatively close to one another. However, they hardly ever spoke to each other after this conversation. The background information on Wang's past is relatively vague, but several key moments of his life were reported. In 2004, Wang divorced his wife due to incompatible differences. It stated that he also lost the custody of his son to the boy's mother, whose name was never mentioned. Wang was a quiet man that was focused on his job. He was never one to reveal his emotions or display a sensitive side of himself to others. It might have been difficult for him to feel comfortable with showing his emotions, especially if he's been hiding it all his life. However, in 2005, he was taken aback after he received a call from Zhang Meng, inviting him out for coffee. When the pair met at the coffee house, Wang unexpectedly opened up about his failed marriage. He poured his heart out to her, mostly about the struggles with his ex-wife. <laughs> Although it's unclear what was mentioned, we don't think it was anything pleasant. <laughs> that coffee chat with Zhang Meng might have given Wang a safe space to be vulnerable without judgment. <laughs> it's likely that both of them enjoyed each other's company, 
because after the initial coffee date, the pair began to meet once every week. Wang liked being around her, and in no time at all, their meetings escalated to twice a week, then thrice a week, until a point where Zhang Meng was ready to reveal her true feelings for Wang. She loved him, but she wasn't entirely sure if Wang felt the same. One day, she finally mustered enough courage and confessed her love. A surge of relief washed over Zhang Meng when she realized that she wasn't the only one that felt this way. Wang loved her too. Their worlds now revolved around each other, and the romance was propelled even stronger because Wang had found a second chance at love. March 16, 2006, a day that Wang still clearly recalls, was the day the couple first had sex. There was just one problem. Zhang Meng had a secret, and she had been hiding it from Wang all this while. Her feelings for Wang were deep, and she knew that she needed to come clean if she wanted to keep this precious relationship. In June of 2006, Zhang Meng revealed to Wang that she was a married woman with a daughter of her own. This piece of news shattered Wang's heart. His thoughts quickly turned dark. His mind was in a state of internal turbulence, apprehension, and negativity about his future with Zhang Meng. If she can hide this crucial detail from me, who's to say that she's not hiding anything else? Wang thought to himself as he sank into the depth of his own thoughts. He accused her of having multiple affairs and he wanted to end the relationship there and then. Wang says, She told me that since the first glance at me, she had fallen in love with me. She wanted to be with me for the rest of her life. While Wang struggled with his emotions, Zhang Meng begged him not to leave her. She tried to convince him that he was the only person that truly mattered to her and that she would leave her current husband in a heartbeat. To prove her point, she even went so far as to use a needle to prick her own finger. Once her finger started to bleed, she pointed it against the ground and wrote, I love Wang Zhi with her blood. Unable to endure the pain, she asked Wang to complete her sentence. <laughs> Teary-eyed, he picked up the needle, pricked his finger, and used the blood on his fingers to finish it. <laughs> At the end, the bloodied sentence read, I love Wang Zhijian. I want to marry him. Wang even continues to take it a step further. He goes on to use the same bloodied finger to write that he would continue to love Zhang until the day of her death. <laughs> Moved by his actions, Zhang Meng made a decision to continue the relationship with Wang. Using one's blood as ink might seem like a morbid thought, but the idea of blood writing has a long and deep history in certain Asian cultures, especially in Chinese Buddhism. Blood writing can be traced back to as early as the year 579, when a Buddhist prince known as Shu Ling used his own blood to make a copy of the Nirvana Sutra. Although we hardly see this in practice these days, writing with one's own blood is still viewed by many people as a way to write with one's spirit. It's considered to be one of the most sincere and empowering gestures that one can do, which is why the idea of using their own blood to declare their love to each other truly struck a chord among them. But the blood-written sentences were only the beginning of a tumultuous romance. In that same year of their newfound romance, Zhang Meng received a call from her husband Feng Jingqiang. He had found out about his wife's affair and demanded for the two men to meet eye to eye. Wang agreed, firmly believing that he was Zhang Meng's one true love. Upon his arrival, the trio broke into a heated exchange. It only ended after Feng ordered his wife to make a decision. Zhang Meng, you decide. It's either me or Wang, Feng said, expecting his wife to have an inclination towards him. 
Zhang chose Wang instead, leaving Feng behind. She had remained true to her promise to Wang after all. But this decision didn't come without its consequences. Zhang Meng's family later found out about her decision and began to harass Wang. Her family objected heavily to the relationship. During interviews, Wang claims that he was beaten and even received death threats. He also says that Zhang's family would look for him at the port where he worked and wouldn't leave until he showed up. It's clear that Zhang's family were enraged. They constantly blame Wang for causing the couple to break up and bringing shame to their family's name. The threats and harassment were beginning to get too much for Wang to handle. He couldn't go anywhere or do anything without always checking his surroundings. This put a lot of pressure on Wang as he was forced to choose between Zhang Meng and his sanity. Court documents also state that Zhang Meng was an emotional person, and this was demonstrated by her response to Wang's attempt to end their relationship. In September of 2006, Zhang Meng had allegedly attempted suicide after Wang had brought up the idea of a breakup. Breaking up is hard enough under normal circumstances, but now that Zhang Meng was threatening to end her life, ending their relationship seemed impossible. Wang ultimately made the decision to opt for an early retirement. When he left the company, he received a lump sum payment of roughly 80,000 Singapore dollars. The couple then fled west to Chengdu to escape the harassment and start a new life together. Three months into their new life, Zhang Meng had filed for a divorce with her husband Feng. Wang was thrilled, as this meant that their relationship could finally advance to a new stage. He was now also deeply devoted and perhaps borderline obsessed with Zhang Meng. In May of 2007, Wang's love for her had reached its peak and he was now looking for ways to express it. Hence, he got a large tattoo of her face put on his back, with a rose at the bottom. He said that he got the tattoo to express his sincere love for her. Despite having a change of scenery, their new life in Chengdu also came with its problems. Wang reveals that within three months of living in Chengdu, he had spent a quarter of the money he was given on branded clothes and expensive meals for Zhang. Zhang Meng also took a daughter along with her to move into Wang's apartment. But despite Wang's best efforts to be kind to the girl, 17-year-old Feng Jianyi rejected him as a father and even loathed him. She held him responsible for her family's disarray and the root cause behind the separation of her parents. For Zhang Meng, getting a good education for her daughter was the ultimate priority. Hence, she tried multiple times to send her daughter to Switzerland for a better education. But she was faced with multiple rejections. Her persistence would pay off, however, when Jian Yu's application for a secondary school in Singapore was approved. And so, in December 2007, the mother and daughter travelled to Singapore, proceeding on to the next chapter of their already fractured lives. <laughs> Students who had become friends with Jian Yu at her new school described her as a cheerful and bright individual. She excelled in her grades and even emerged top of her class despite English being her second language. Things were looking great for Jian Yu, but not the same could be said for Wang and Zhang's relationship. Throughout the next few months, the couple would face a series of breakups and reunifications. On one occasion, in March of 2008, Zhang Meng even returned back to China just to track down Wang to talk about their relationship. Everything changed when she asked him to follow her to Singapore, promising him a new and better life. Come to Singapore with us. We'll start over. We're meant for each other, and you know that. I don't know about this. I do still love you deeply, but I'm afraid I won't have enough money to support your lavish lifestyle. It doesn't matter. I'll take care of you. This could change everything. We can finally be together. I promise I'll take care of you. Zhang Meng said as she gazed into Wang's eyes with a deeply affectionate look. Sensing that he was apprehensive, Zhang Meng persuaded him again. I promise to help you find work. This way, we can finally be together, far away from my family members. Nothing will ever come between us again. 
Wang agreed, and in July 2008, he packed his life in a suitcase and boarded a flight straight to Singapore. Sharing a rental flat in Yishun with other subtenants, the house served as a temporary area for the couple to start afresh. Wang also got another tattoo. This time, a snake on his left shoulder and a skeleton grabbing a heart on the right shoulder. According to Wang, the snake symbolized the viciousness of Jiang Meng, while the skeleton resembled a dead god, slowly and gradually swallowing his heart. The dead god referred to Jiang Meng. But despite all the tattoos on his body that reminded him of his love, Wang says that his life in Singapore was nothing close to what she had promised him earlier. Instead, he claimed that during his time in Singapore, he was subjected to bizarre and humiliating treatment. On many occasions, he had bought food for them with his own money, cooked for them while he dined on their leftovers, and painstakingly hand-washed their laundry, even their underwear. Wang claims that in return, he was forced to stay in the bedroom naked. He says on record, Zhang Meng, this allowed me to leave my bedroom. She did not want me to meet the tenants. I suspected Zhang Meng did not want the tenants to know about our relationship. Jian Yu disliked me, and Zhang Meng told me to stay in the bedroom most of the time. There were two main reasons why. The first reason being Jian Yu disliked me. Secondly, Zhang Meng did not want me to see or talk to the tenant Yang Jie. I felt myself confined in that bedroom. She controlled all my movement. I felt I felt I was being suppressed. Since the room he stayed in didn't have a toilet attached inside, he had no other choice but to relieve himself into plastic bags and newspapers. When I stayed in my bedroom on several occasions, I passed motion and urinated inside the bedroom. Since Zhang did not like me to go out when the other two tenants were in the house, I would dispose my feces and urine wrapped in newspaper and plastic bags when Jian Yu and the two tenants left the house. According to one of the subtenants, Wang rarely walked around the flat, and each time she saw Wang, he kept his head down without ever starting a conversation or establishing eye contact with her. Wang goes on to say that he would never dare to retaliate or challenge Zhang Meng's authority, out of fear that she might come up with an even harsher rule or even threaten him with suicide like she did in the past. In total, Wang made three separate trips to Singapore on social visit passes. He says that for his first trip, the 500 Singapore dollars he had brought with him had been wiped out in just four days. Most of the money was used to pay for Zhang Meng's lavish expenses, including a $140 crab dish at a nearby seafood restaurant. His second trip to Singapore was meant for work. Zhang Meng had previously introduced him to various employment agents in Singapore that offered to find him a job at a fee. However, this plan quickly turned into a nasty argument after she refused to pay the Asian fee on his behalf. The couple argued for days and Wang returned back to China without securing a job. Just a few days later, Zhang Meng received news that her daughter Jian Yu would soon be transferred to one of Singapore's most prestigious secondary schools. With sheer delight, she phoned Wang and asked him if he could come back to help arrange the move. Wang was happy. This was good news. He agreed and quickly boarded the next flight back to Singapore. During this trip, he had brought along all of his life savings, close to 1,300 Singapore dollars. He arrived on the 9th of September, 2008, and within five days, he had already spent close to a third of the money. $120 was spent for two crabs, which he had even personally cooked for both Zhang and her daughter, Jian Yu. It's reported that at the end of the meal, two pieces of crab were left for Wang. But because Jian Yu wanted to leave it for breakfast the next day, he was left with nothing. He had spent the money and the time to cook the crabs, but he never even got to taste them. It's now 8 p.m. on September 18th, 2008, nine days after Wang arrived in Singapore. Wang was sitting in the bedroom, 
when he heard the door open. It was Zhang Meng. She told him that they were craving the taste of crab and were planning to have it for dinner the next day. Wang reminded her that they had only recently eaten crabs and that doing so every week would be way too expensive. When Zhang Meng heard this, her replies were vicious and brutal. This was a statement made by Wang. Zhang Meng humiliated and used vulgar words on me. She scolded me, poor fellow. In actual fact, I have some savings, but she spent it all for me. She wanted money from me to buy crab. I did not give it to her. She said I am a poor fellow, and how can I afford to support her? I told her I have spent all my savings on her. What does she expect from me? She even said that I was produced by dogs and donkeys. She confines me in the house every day and only allows me to go out once to purchase goods. I was not allowed to go to the toilet. On hearing all these, I became very angry. That same night, while Zhang Meng was fast asleep, Wang tossed and turned. He says, I felt that I couldn't breathe. My whole body was trembling. My, mi- my mind was a blank. The blood was gushing to my head. I did not see anything before my eyes. Everything was red. I was unable to control my thoughts. It's now close to midnight. Wang continued to think about how wicked she was and how she couldn't care less about his hard-earned money. He got up and surrendered to his thoughts. He opened the door and headed straight into the kitchen. There, he placed his hands on the countertop, gripping the edges with sheer intensity. He smoldered with resentment and it was getting increasingly difficult for him to breathe. (gasps) With rage pulsing through his veins, he grabbed a knife that was in the kitchen drawer and slowly crept back to the bedroom. Inside the dark bedroom, he took a deep breath and swallowed down his frustration. (sighs) Wielding the knife in his hands, he jumped on top of Zhang Meng and plunged the knife straight into her abdomen. Ah! Ah! Zhang Meng wasn't the only one to get hurt that night. Others would also perish at the hands of Wang Zhijian. We'll provide a revived look on the disastrous events that occurred inside the room as well as the aftermath of the tragedy that left the only survivor scarred for life. That's coming up in the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Heinous, an Asian true crime podcast brought to you by Mediacorp and produced by 1UP Media. If you would like to share some feedback or suggest other cases that you would like us to cover, head on down to our website at asiantruecrimepodcast.com. This episode was researched, produced, and written by Yo Guang Jin, with audio engineering by Ethan Sam. Special thanks to executive producers Danny Cordy and Barry Toh from Media Corp. We hope to see you again soon in the next episode of Heinous. Hey